Well, let's pick it up at verse 37. Luke chapter 22. Well, let's go back to chapter 21 and verse 37. Uh, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So he's teaching every day. This is the last week of Jesus' life. Now you and I read the Bible, and you and I understand what's happening here. They just don't get it. They're not getting it. They're not getting that they're coming to die. They're, that he's coming there to die for the sins of the world. That he is coming, as Isaiah was telling us in Isaiah 51 and 53 and 55, that he comes as the suffering Messiah. In fact, the Jews are still waiting for the, uh, the Psalm chapter 2 Messiah, who will come and rule with an iron scepter. And they're going to accept the Antichrist instead. And then, then it will be revealed, and again, as we continue on in our study of, of the end times here, but right now, he's in the temple, and he's teaching every day. He's there every day, but yet the, the, the religious elite the, are afraid to uh, come after him. He's already cleansed the temple. You've made my father's house a den of robbers when it's supposed to be a, a house of prayer. And, and it was supposed to be for all the nations of the world that they would be able to come and, and to receive this information, this knowledge, and this understanding of God and have that relationship with him. And so here in verse 1 of chapter 22, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. At this time, this is like a, a double Sabbath. It's a, it's, a, it's a high holiday. Not only is this Passover uh, uh, one of the feasts that uh, all three times a year, all Jewish men are supposed to make it to Jerusalem and to celebrate and to do the Passover. But now there's a high holy day with this unleavened bread. So there's, a, there's like a double Sabbath that's going on there, or a double blessing of a day here. So now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Junior, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they, fear, uh, for they feared the people. How they killed him now... Uh, Nero, in Nero's time, uh, you know, uh, many years later after this, in Nero's time, around 70 or, uh, uh, or before 70 A.D., um, uh, Nero took a census. And remember, all the conquered peoples, that all the nations that Rome had conquered, uh, they just accepted Caesar worship no problem because they were into all this pantheonism. They were into many gods. And it didn't matter that they were conquered and add Nero or add the Caesar worship. It really didn't bother them at all. But, he, but there was something about Jerusalem that, uh, and again, the nation of Israel, that they just got in uproars when, uh, uh, when idols were brought in. And he wanted to know just exactly how many people are traveling to Jerusalem. They did a, they did a, a survey. And they got something like uh, two, they, they wanted to know on, the, on, on Passover of one day or uh, how many lambs were slaughtered. And they took a conservative estimate possibly of 256,000 lambs were sacrificed in that Passover. And they did the estimation if that equals, and one lamb could cover 10 men, and the, it, 10 people could go in on one lamb. Quite possibly at any given time during these Passover times was 2.7 million people in Jerusalem. When normally there are only numbers in the thousands. And so here... There's a lot of people here. And now you throw this double one on, and you understand, well, why does it always change? Look, they, they follow the 360-day the year type calendar. They follow the, the movement of the sun. And what's happening here, this is a full moon. This is a, a full moon harvest time that's going on. And, so, and, and the way this works out in their schedule, now it's all lined up, and there's like this double blessing or this double holiday, not only the Passover, but of unleavened bread. And so there's a lot more people there. And Jesus is in the temple every day teaching. And the chief priests, they wanted to kill him. They sought how to do that. Verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. And we know, again, we read our Bibles, we know that Judas is part of the twelve. He's one of the apostles there. And then he conspired with him. There's, there's been a lot of books read, and, read uh, or written, and I've read, that I wish I were never written, and I never read about the speculation of why Judas would do this to Jesus and betray him. Well, because he was a zealot, and he just maybe he thought if Jesus was arrested, the people would uprise, and now he'd be you know, made king, and they would do that. He just somehow got the rebellion going. That was his whole idea. Could be. That's what, that's what those guys were like, those zealots were like. Could have been that maybe he's upset. Maybe he's upset. That, uh, that Jesus wasn't going to be the, the king now and establish his throne. And so now maybe he's just, just mad at him and turning him in. 
all these books and all these speculations. But understand this. Let's just look at the text here. He was betrayed by someone very, very close to him that he spent three and a half years with ministering. And for whatever his motive is, whatever his thing, the, the end result is, he's been betrayed. And here's this thing that Satan entered Judas. And this is the thing about possession that you have to offer yourself up to it. It wasn't that he had no control over what, of it whatsoever, but that he allowed Satan to enter into him and it betrayed Jesus. And, and Judas had to be a willing participant. It wasn't that God created Judas just for the specific purpose to do this. In other words, there was always a holdout. There was always forgiveness. There was always things. And you'll see as we go through here that there was always an opportunity for Judas to repent. But that's what he was already, as some would say, predisposed to do. He was already going to do it. But there was still that opportunity there. There's been many books read that he asked for forgiveness and when he hung himself on the tree and he died and we'll see him in heaven. I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty sure when I get to heaven, people are going to be surprised to see me. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to be surprised who's not there, who I really thought should be there. And so, here's the thing. So forget about all the books. Let's just look at the text of the Scripture right here. Satan entered Judas. Judas allowed it. He was party to it. So he went on his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So they promised and, and sought opportunity to betray him uh, to them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Passover, and especially when it's the, it comes to dealing with the unleavened bread, because you were to get leaven out. Remember the whole thing about the Passover. The children were in Egypt, children of Israel in Egypt, and the whole Passover. In other words, you had to sacrifice the lamb and atone the blood, and it would come to the shape of a cross, by the way, folks, on the, on the doorposts and on the lentils on each side, and you would make this sign, and it would drip down, and the blood of that sacrificed lamb would, and the angel would pass over, and all the firstborn of Egypt died, except the children of Israel and their firstborn children because they atoned, they applied the blood. And then God commanded them, you will do this. This will be a remembrance for you. You will do this and you will sacrifice the sacrifice, sacrifice lamb and this will be passing over. And then because they, after that, the Pharaoh would say, now it's time to get out. And they had to leave quickly and they had no time to wait for the bread to rise with the leaven that was in it. And so it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's happening here as well. And so here... They get this unleavened bread that there'd be no, no uh, uh, leaven in it to, to make it rise. So, in, in other words, symbolizing that they, that they had to leave quickly. And so for a month before, and in Jewish tradition as it is right now, you're supposed to be spending a month getting out all the leaven. And what a, the, the man of the house would do, or all the kids would try to find the leaven and do those things, and then they would, finally there would be the, the man. And it's supposed to be that the man's supposed to go around and do it, but the way Jewish tradition is, the wife does it all, and she leaves a little bit of leaven out, and the man's able to come with a, a special dustpan, leaven pan that's going to be burned, it's paper and a feather, and he finally goes to the rest of the leaven and puts it all up, and then he goes to the fire with all the devout Jewish men and throws the fire in. I've cleansed my house of all the leaven. When... Hilda's back there doing all the work. and That's the Jewish tradition that happens right now. And so you would spend a month preparing for this, cleaning your house and getting out all the leaven and doing all these things and being ready for this. So he tells them to Peter and John, saying to them, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. Huh? I mean, where, where are we going to go? Look, they said to them, where do you want us to pre I mean, prepare? I mean, I mean, they're just, they're kind of perplexed. I mean, not like, sarcastically, but just, um, is he not getting the plot here? We haven't been around for a month. I mean, we have no, I mean, they're really confused right here. And he says, go and prepare. And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, uh, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Which is going to be odd because it's the women who go down to the well. Remember John chapter 4, the women go to the well and that woman came later because she's not going to hang out with all the really devout women earlier. Then we get that in John chapter 4. And, and so here, a guy carrying a pitcher of water is, is, is going to stick out. It's going to stick out. The, <clears throat> I wanted one time to go with a friend of mine to uh, Southeast Asia, to, to Vietnam, to go and preach the gospel. 
And I was all ready to go and everything. He says, you can't go. He goes, why? Because you're a giant. The maximum height requirement to be involved in this mission organization is 5'5". Five, five. And even at that, you're a giant. And, and you can't, you can't, you, you got to be able to blend in, you know. It's easy when this giant's walking among the land. And everyone says, foreigner. So you're kidding me. I want to go and I want to preach the gospel. I got a five, five. And no, you just, it doesn't work. Ha, ha. So, you know, you just do that song. You're vertically challenged. You can't do that. What? That's reverse discrimination. They're trying to prepare. And they're just not getting it. And he says, go and get this picture, this man with this pitcher of water. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. How does he do that? Remember, they've already committed Grand Theft Donkey, right? He goes, says, go to the town. And so that, go to the, the, the Lord has need of it. That's the code word. Okay, take it. How does Jesus do that? We had a guy one time who would, he just, for some reason, just started coming to the office and started to serve. And, and there had been a brother who had been coming there the same, I mean, coming there all, you know, for about a year. And this brother just turns around, the, the brother who just started to show up, he goes, wow, bro, hey, man, so you, you, you've been coming to the office too, huh? Isn't it great? I mean, so, um, it, you know, it's, and he just says, it's really good to see here, bro, serving. And the other brother looks at him and just goes, Bro, I've been coming here for a year. It's good that you finally showed up. Oh, do you think just because you showed up that all of a sudden all this stuff just kind of happens? We, there's already people. And this, this is the thing that Jesus continually amazes him. Like, well, who, let, who lost Jesus? I, I was watching him. You're watching, how, did he, how did he get out of our side? How did he go and set this up? How did he work this out? We were always with Jesus. I mean, the way that you read the Scripture, Jesus was never alone. He always had a disciple or apostle attached to Him somehow. They never let Him out of His sight. How can that happen? Well, some of you have tried following me, especially when I was 400 pounds. And I can get away from you. How did that, how did that happen? It was I only three seconds. He just... Jesus, and understand this, it goes back all the way to the Old Testament. Elijah. Oh, Lord. You know, Jezebel's trying to kill me. King Ahab, only I am left. And God's like, uh, no. You think because you're the only one left in this area, in this region, because of your eyesight, because what you can only, you think you're the only one? I have 7,000 more who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There's 7,000 more, 7, more. Then all of a sudden, so I'm not special? Yes. You are very Especially unique, just like everyone else. I mean, sometimes that just gets us. Sometimes we, we, we get in our eyesight here, and we get in our own thoughts that we're, we're the only ones, that this the only one can do it, and all of a sudden, he's got other disciples. He's got other things. There's other things going on. Jesus can, without me? He can do this without me? And they're just continually perplexed. And, and, and again, behold, when you enter, okay, we've been here before. I know, go to the other town. There's a donkey there. We've been, okay, I, I got it. And, and we see with this, with the language before, they were really hesitant. With this language now, they're like, okay, not a problem. Do you understand when you come to that trial or that temptation or that testing and, and you make it through, that you have a lot more confidence and boldness to continue on with the Lord? But hey, the reverse is opposite. The more that you say no, the more you fail the test, the more that you don't even try to do the test, the harder it will be the next time and you'll lose more and more confidence. Works the other way as well, folks. Be obedient. That's what the Christian safety net is, right? Obedience. That's the Christian safety net. And so here, verse 12, Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. We'll get to it in a couple of weeks here, but we know that's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. We know there's going to be a feast that's going to partake, that we're going to partake of after the rapture of the church, and we're going to have that. And then, folks, once you get excited, we get to eat twice. We get the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we get the feast in the kingdom. 
That's awesome, man. I, just, I don't know about you, but I just dream about heaven and the things we get to eat and don't put on any weight. I think it's awesome. We're just there. Everything's perfected. More meatballs, please. Whatever it is. But understand this, that we will partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb after the rapture of the church and we're brought together with our bridegroom. And then we also get the feast in the kingdom. And look what Jesus says here. He's earnestly desired this with them. This is his, well, his last supper. This is his last end. This is the thing that he's going to impart to them, that he's going to talk to them. This is his last encounter with them. And so really the next few chapters is, is just of really the last instructions, the last things of Jesus' life. And that's really what you're going to remember someone by, is those last things. That's what you really remember them by. And so here he's pointing I fervently, I've desired to, to be with you, to do this. And it says here in verse 17, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it. Uh, took up the cup and said, gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And, the, and truly the Son of Man goes that it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So let's backtrack. Judas, still time to back out. God's going to accomplish His will. Jesus is going to die for the sins of the world. It doesn't have to be with Judas. Judas is a willing participant in this. But look at the grace and the love. The, the apostles, they figure this out later because when they figure out what happened with Judas and stuff. But just think about it at the dinner. I'm giving you this opportunity. I'm shooting one out for you here, Judas. The hand of my betrayer is here at the table with me. Now let's backtrack a little bit further. You have to understand the whole setting. There was usually four cups that you would drink from. You have one that you can constantly drink from, but these four cups that you would drink from. The first cup was the cup of Thanksgiving. The last cup was the cup of redemption. And you weren't supposed to drink that cup until the redemption was finalized. So you understand this whole scene here. And then he takes this bread... In Jewish tradition right now, it's that, again, the three crackers or wafers are the, known as uh, the matzah. And you'd put three of them. And there would be a game that you would do. You'd take the middle matzah underneath this veil. It's all under a veil. Take this matzah, break it in half, leave the rest in there, and then go hide one piece. And then the game is, throughout the meal, kids are looking for that matzah. They're looking for that hidden piece. They're looking for that thing that needs to be revealed. And then when it's revealed, they bring it back to the master, the Lord of the table, and He rewards them. This is what's going on. doesn't say that there's any kids there that are doing that, but He takes that middle matzah, breaks it, and He takes out and breaks it, doesn't put it back in there, and says, divide it out with all of you. I mean, so there's this whole thing like, oh, man. He's putting his peas in his mashed potatoes. How can he? That's bad manners. He's doing something wrong here. This is, and, and so this is the whole thing. What's going on? And you just get the whole thing that's going on. It's, just, it's like this. There you go. Oh, he's doing something. And they're bringing it. And he says, this is my body. The folks, they're not getting it. You and I get it. But they're not getting it. Which is broken for you. Jesus, again, brings back to remembrance what he said in John chapter 6. And about this is symbolic. This is... Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. And then a real wicked verse, John chapter 6, verse 66. 666. I just got weird one day and I started going through all the Bible passages that were 666. And lo and behold, it lands on this one. It says, And then they departed from Jesus and walked with him no more. Well, I think that's apropos for 666. It just follows on that. But there it is, folks, that, that this is a hard saying. And Jesus goes on to further explain them. Look, the words I speak to you are spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. The words I speak to you are spirit. So this is a memorial. This is a remembrance. Remembrance of what? And he goes through the whole process again and explains his death, and now he'll come back to life and pay for the sins of the world. Still not getting it. So all these things are coming to pass. He's handing these things out. He's giving it to them. And he keeps telling them, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 22, And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe... Uh, to that man by whom he is betrayed. We know that in Psalm 22, the very detailed description of the crucifixion and how Jesus Christ was murdered and paid the price for yours and I sin. 
We know according to Isaiah, and we know from all the other prophecies, over the 360 different prophecies, detailed prophecies, when you break it down, there are 72 prophecies. Then every time a new nuance, a new detail is brought to it, it adds it up. There are 360 detailed prophecies of, of the Messiah, of where he would be born, how he would be born, how he would be raised, what his name would be, what is going to happen to him, how he will minister, how he will be put to death, and how he will come back to life and reign and rule forever and ever. 360 of them. And that's what Jesus is equating here. He says, look what's happening here. He says, as it's been determined. It's already been told to you. That's why when he's come to Jerusalem, he says, you should have known the day of my arrival. When it comes to that triumphal entry, as our idiot notes say in our Bibles there, in the headlines there, whatever. But this triumphal entry, this entering into Jerusalem, he says, you should, and he weeps over, you should have known. This is the 173,880th day from the time that the building of, uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem goes from Artaxerxes in 445 B.C. 173,880 days. Messiah will come riding in on a donkey. It's going to happen. That's all you had to do is just wait. And they still, you did not know the hour of your visitation. You did not know the hour that it was coming. Verse 23, Then they began to question amongst themselves. What do you think this is? Okay, put your hands up. What you, he just handed them bread. Totally blew the whole Passover thing. Jesus didn't know what he was doing here. Breaking bread, handing him the wine, doing all this kind of stuff, telling him this is his body and this is his blood. And they sat there going, no way. What are the deep spiritual meanings to this? Jesus is trying to say something to us here. Well, let's just see what verse 23 says. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would, who would do this thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which one of them should be the, considered the greatest. So on one hand, like, not me, not me. I mean, it would be the equivalent of being a parent. Okay, who's going to betray me? And everyone, not me. Not me, I don't know, and somebody else lives here, right? <laughs> not me, not me. It's just, mm. We know from the other gospel accounts, they said, well, which one? And this is how dense they are, and you and I are right there. It says, the one that I dip this sop, dip this bread in this sop, and hand it to him, that is the one who's the betrayer. Judas? Wow. What's that mean? Heavy. Look what happens here. Judas is going through all this. Judas is seeing the breaking of the bread. He's already allowed Satan to enter into him. He's already betrayed him. There's still time to pull out. And he sees all these things are going on. And it's what Jesus is saying. And now, verse 25. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise a lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be the, as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? It is, is it not he who sits at the table? Uh, yet I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestows one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's pretty heavy. So who's going to betray him? What's going to happen here? What's going on? I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. You know, we're in Jerusalem. This, this could really happen. This, we're getting close now. This could really happen. We could really be serving Jesus and be serving on the thrones and be uh, having all this stuff. And they're greatest. And then he begins to tell them. Remember in, in the custom, in the culture, that the older had the rights of the inheritance. Whatever the oldest son had, or whatever the father had to give to the oldest son, it was up to the oldest son to take care of everybody else. And he didn't have to give anything if he didn't want to. But he says, well, be as the younger. Well, the younger, he might not get anything left or... And then he gives them the example of himself. He says, who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Well, obviously, you say the one who's sitting at the table. But I tell you, it's the one who serves. Look at me, Jesus says. You, you, you guys keep trying to serve me. You keep trying to make me king by force. You keep trying to do all these things for me. But aren't I one who is serving? We know after this account that, that Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. 
begin to wash their feet and minister. I mean, just again, bring this. And that's just not the, the power kingdom that they're looking for. They're still missing it. Jesus is still not fitting their perception and their predisposed ideas and their assumptions and presumptions of what the Messiah is supposed to be like. They keep looking at Psalm 2. They keep looking at the rule of the iron scepter. They keep looking at all these other things, but they don't want to look at the fact that He first has to come as a suffering Messiah. And so here, He says, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Not so. You're not. It's just be as the younger. And look in your own family. What has happened with the younger? Get away from me, kid. You bother me or whatever. Just get away. Just be as the younger. Be as the least. Then you never have to worry about being dissed. <laughs> never have to worry about, hey, can you move out of that seat? You know, someone more important is, is coming along. And so here, these things are getting real heavy. It's starting to get tense in there. And then the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Man. To, to be sifted as we understand this, we, we get this nice little flour sifted package. You know, all the kernels are gone. Other things are right there. And we get the flour. You can get fine flour, not so fine flour. Uh, um, and flour and it's, already, it's already milled. It's already there for us. But understand what it is to sift wheat in that day. You go to the threshing floor and you stomp on it. You're jumping up and down and you're cracking the kernel and you're stomping on it. And then you've got your things that you're beating with, the, 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 the brushes and stuff, and then you're throwing it up and then letting the wind blow the chaff out. And sometimes in your flour, you, you might not get a really good sifted batch of flour. You've got some crunchy kernels in there. and Oh, oh man. Oh, good, good muffins. Uh, and he's saying, look, he, so get the, uh, get the terminology, get the impression down. Satan has asked to stomp on you. But look at the peace that Jesus gives. But I pray for you. Pray for me, Jesus? Couldn't you just tell him not to? Couldn't you say, Satan, be gone? Couldn't you put this hedge of protection around me? I don't know why landscaping is the Satan's weakness, but couldn't you put this hedge around? Couldn't you? Couldn't you? Do something to protect... Couldn't, couldn't you just tell them to stop, not, not to come by? But we know what the testing of our faith produces. And, and He allows us to go on. It's the same that happened with Job. Here's the benefit that Simon gets that Job never got. And Job still served the Lord. Job never, to even the day he went to be with the Lord, Job never had the benefit of knowing chapter 1 of Job, where God was bragging on him. Hey, you seen Job? The last thing you want God to do is brag to Satan about you. I mean, that's just setting you up. Like these fools over here trying to taunt me with a bigger cup. That's just, that's just going to bring more. That's just going to bring more. <laughs> you understand, folks, that He wants to stomp on you and sift you as wheat. Where God tells us that He's a roaming lion seeking whom He may devour. Jesus tells us of that Lucifer, of that Satan, that deceiver, that He is here to rob, steal, to kill, to destroy. The enemy never takes a holiday, takes a vacation when it comes to whatever foul little minion, demon, devil is following after you is in charge of messing up your life. They just go, you know, I'm just going to give him a break today. It's just constant, constant, constant coming after us and attacking us to, to tear us down. Because here's the thing. He can no longer take us back. can no longer take us to hell. But what He can do, and what the enemy instructs his minions to do, is to mess up yours and I's lives so we don't tell others about Jesus. It gets us hung up on being hypocrites. And I'm sure there's plenty of us there today, all right? Have you looked in the mirror? I think at any times there's pride, there's hypocrisy, there's all these things. There's all these imperfect people coming to church. That's why the church is so messed up. You and I keep coming to it. And you can never join the perfect church because as soon as you do, you've just ruined it. You've corrupted it. You're the corrupter. <laughs> Bill, do you know what perfect people eat for breakfast every morning? Yeah, I didn't think he'd know either. I keep asking. You guys, 
but look at the grace in this. And when you come back after you've fallen, wait a minute. He's already talking as if something's already... Well, I'm, I'm right there with you. Jesus, I was there. I, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus goes on to explain, well, yeah, then I'm going to be suffering, I'm going to die, I'm going to be put to death. And Peter with that bold, not so, Lord. And then Jesus speaks to him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because he was speaking to that influence that was in Peter's life. He says, no, I thought that's not, from, that's not from God. What you just said was from God, that yeah, I'm the Christ, I'm the Son of God. And so look at Peter's bold statement here. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Yeah, we used to say that on the block too. But the first one in the box with the cops gets the better deal. We know that one too. You say, oh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm down with you, man. I'm there. I'm, I'm right there with you. But if I can get $5,000 for being a confidential informant and you go to jail and I can buy more dope, you're gone. And so the thing that comes down here, I'm ready to, to go with you both to prison and then to death. Then he said to them, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. See, here's the thing about prophecy. God foretelling the future before it happens, that he knows it. It's in such detail. I mean, if you're trying to be vague, it, it, mostly people who are the Christian fortune tellers, they believe they're these prophets and that you give them a little bit of money and they can tell you what might happen in your life and all that kind of stuff. They're very vague. They're not very detailed. 360 detailed, intimate prophecies about his name, his birth, his place of, of residence, and where he's going to be, and how he's going to die. Everything about him to his day that he's going to enter in, riding on a donkey, to the very words that he'll say on the cross. And to, for the very words that the Roman centurion will say after he hears and sees Jesus. That's just way too much detail. You're really blocking yourself in, Jesus, to, you know, you're really locking yourself into this. And then he says, but you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Verse 35, and he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. Not totally sure what that verse means right there. But just one of, of preparation and just one of being prepared and to going out. But again, God is still going to provide for them. Verse 37, For I say to you that which is written must, be, uh, must still be accomplished in me. And he who, ha who was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. Psalm 22. Isaiah 53.12 these are the very things that Jesus is saying, I'm going to be numbered with the transgressors. How, how he's going to be, and who is going to be crucified next to? So they said, Lord, look here, our two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Well, didn't he tell them, now go sell your garments and buy swords? They, they, were, they were concealing all along, it looks like. They've had, it, they've had it with them all along. Here we have two swords. He goes, hey, hey, that's enough. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as was his, as he, as was his uh, custom, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them for about a stone's throw, and he knelt down to pray. I understand they're also going to be singing Psalm 118. These praise psalms. As they're leaving the, the, the Jerusalem, they've had the Passover meal, they're coming through. And they're singing and they're going down uh, the Kidron Valley, going up to the Mount of Olives. And you read the Psalm 118 and all the other praise psalms about the Messiah. They're singing about Him. And there's this worship going on. There's this praise and adoration that's going on. They're joyful. And He says to, that you may not enter into temptation. And then he, again, He withdrew Himself. He knelt down. Verse 42, saying, Father, if it's Your will, take this cup away from Me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. It, understand this, and, and you can cross references with the other passages. He was not burdened. Understand that he was not burdened about the sins that would be placed upon him. He was not burdened. He was readily and willing to do that. How do I know that? You can fast forward and you can hear His words on the cross. 
He did not say, God, Father, Eloi, why all these sins? What was the thing that he was crying out about? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father had to turn away. It was not your sins that he was bummed like, oh man. And I've read many books and commentaries and all this kind of stuff. It was not. It was not your sins or my sins that he was burdened about. He was really going to, he's going to take one for the team, folks. But taking one for the team, not just paying the price for our sins, but this was going to be the first time ever he would not be in fellowship with the Father for a moment. And that would be agonizing. That he would spend those hours on a time with God the Father. Because remember, sin. My eyes are too pure. I cannot look upon sin. There's a few things God can't do. And one of them is He can't look upon sin. Another one is He can't stop loving us. But if it is your... If this cup, this whole thing, what? To be out of fellowship, to be out of the presence of God. To not have that communion, that, that connection to be broken. You see, you and I have already felt that. You and I have already felt what it is to be separated. Because why? Because now that we are with God, we go, wow, that's what I was missing? When it comes to the point, when it comes to doing sin and we break in the heart of God, it comes to the point where we're like, wow, if I do that, I have to stop doing this to go over and do that. And that means I won't be in fellowship with God the Father. And I'm out of pocket. I'm out of sorts. I don't like that feeling. I don't like to be out of, out of protection and a, a broken fellowship with God. I first and foremost got to get that right. Because if I have broken fellowship with God, God help the rest of you. most dangerous person on the face of the earth is a backsliding Christian. But if I'm out of sorts with Him, that's why I need to get my relationship squared away with God first and then my relationship with others. Well, that'll just be taken care of. Why wouldn't I want to love one another? Why wouldn't I want to care about you? Why wouldn't I want to pray for you? I'm in, I'm in fellowship with the Father. Of course I'm going to do that. Of course I'm going to love any. Of course we're going to. Of course I'm going to forgive. Of course I'm going to do that. Why? Because I'm in fellowship with the Father. I'm not in fellowship with the Father. Run. Run fast. And so here, but not my will, but your will be done. See, I'm grateful that He took upon Himself my sins that were all paid for. But I don't know what it's like to always have perfect fellowship with the Father, to live a sinless life, and for the first time ever, that God would have to look away. Oh. I mean, there's glimpses of it. I've heard other people's. I've heard other Christians, and I've heard them. They've heard me. And I... But man, I've never been perfect. And so here, then the angel appeared to him, verse 43, from heaven, strengthening him. You know that's what angels are for, folks? They're ministering spirits sent to strengthen and encourage you and I. Oh, we get this whole mythology about having guardian angels that we got two because one-third of the heavenly hosts left heaven with Lucifer. So that left two-thirds there. And so we get this whole thing that we have two angels, one on each side. Not me, man. I think I got a whole platoon. I'm busy. I'm a busy beaver, man. I can get a lot of trouble, man. I need a platoon after me. And so here, this angel came and he ministered to him. Verse 44, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat began, became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter in temptation. So, Jesus is telling us there, if we do this prayer, and, and this word prayer is not, O Lord, if we cometh to you, if today, O God, if heareth me, if now, if this sinnereth cometh to you, if today. This word prayer means a worshiping prayer. It means praying and, and worshiping God, enveloping that. I mean, what we did this morning was, was praising God, but it can be prayer as well, just in that communion in time. And that would keep you from temptation. And I practice this in my own life. There's times I might be in situations, I just start singing praise songs. I don't know one all the way through unless the music's there, so I just throw them all together. But I'm just praising and I'm just worshiping and it, and it keeps me out of temptation. There's times when I've been in situations and I'm just in my, in my heart, I've just started singing and there's some when they're like, I got to get out of this and I'm just like, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise the above creatures below. And people like, what are you doing? Just looking. 
I just want to let you know, when I'm doing that, there's something going on in my head. That's just got to go out. It's just not that I'm just a praise machine. It's just that there's thoughts and some things going through my head, and I'm letting you know how I practice it. I just start singing out songs to the Lord. And you know what? It goes away. The voices begin to go away because God inhabits what? The praises of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. So that's how I apply this verse. You do what you want with it, but I understand this verse. I, I read it with the, the word prayer. We only have one word for the word prayer in, in English language, and that word is prayer. Very good. But you go to the original language that the New Testament is written in Greek, and you get this word, and it means one of prayerful worship, and that you will avoid temptation. Think about it. You're robbing a bank, and you go and sing and praying songs to the Lord. You're not probably going to rob that bank. Here, oh, here comes the bank robbing Christian. I mean, maybe that's what you get labeled at or something like that. You're in a certain situation. You just start praising and worshiping God. I'm just giving out of my life. It keeps you out of a lot of trouble. And you look like a freak to those people, and they never invite you back. Problem solved. He just starts singing praise songs whenever he's around us. Don't invite him anymore. Well, there you go. I'm not going to be in that situation anymore. Now am I? It's a win-win situation. Why do you sleep, rise, and pray, lest you enter into temptation? So this trial. Jesus tried to telegraph something. There's something coming down the way, and you, and you don't know it. And, and you don't know it. And here, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? We only have one word for the word kiss in the English language, and that word is? Excellent Bible scholars. But when you go to the Greek original language here, Judas was approaching him to kiss him with a philoi kiss, a brotherly, affectionate kiss. Jesus says, are you trying to kiss me deeply and passionately, not romantically? This is how intimate and dear you are, and this is how you're going to betray me. You know, Judas has got a bad name now. In fact, the goat that leads sheep to the slaughter, they call that the Judas goat. Because he turns right, sheep go left. And they're just following one sheep after the next, and the goat's okay. And so here, Judas betrays him. And, and he says, with this passionate, this intimate, with intimacy, with knowledge, you know full well what you're doing. Verse 49, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Before you can answer, I just without looking, maybe this is your first time. Maybe it's your first time. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. Without answering, who do you think picks up a sword and starts flailing away? Peter, all right. You guys read it ahead or it's just an educated guess. Before you can say no, one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said, Permit even this? Permit? No, no. And he touched his ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your, but this is your hour and, and the power of darkness. Having arrested him, they led him in and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. If you're making notes here, following Jesus at a distance ends disastrously. Following Jesus casually is not going to end up good for you. Following Jesus from afar, whatever translation you're reading, is, is going to keep you very far away from Him. You're either there or you're not. No one gets married. And again, 23 years of marriage today, my proposal to my wife was, look, we're going to get married, but it's going to be secret. We can't tell anybody. It's just between you and I. Or, yeah, we're going to be married, but you're never going to see me. We'll Skype now and then. I know what we'll do. We'll get a marriage Facebook page. That's what we'll do. Type in our moods and stuff like that. Following from a distance is not going to work out for Peter. Now we know from the other Gospel accounts what happened. They said we're seizing Jesus. and says, I am here you seek. And what happens? Woof! They all are laid out. That's the only occasion I see that anyone was slain in the Spirit. But understand, they were all just wiped out. And they just... And they get back up. 
Uh, we're looking for Jesus? A little timid this time. He says, I'm one, I'll go with you. Who was really in control that day? Jesus just wasn't, you know, helpless. Could have called down a legions of angels to come and rescue him. And he willingly gave himself over. They didn't capture him. They came there with clubs and swords and everything, and then he lays them all out, and then they get back up, and he willingly turns himself over to them. And so here they take him. Having led him and brought him into the high priest's house, Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man is, was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know you. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I'm not. Verse 59, Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, and he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Man, you deny him. We know from the other gospel accounts, Peter really had to start cursing. He had to get foul. He had to do all kinds of things to try to convince them that he wasn't one of them. That's oftentimes what you have to do, though, when you walk with the Lord for a while, and then you have to do things to try to convince people. It's just not convincing. But he denies them, and, and, and the other gospel accounts tell us loudly, cursing. I don't know, what are you doing? Blah, say, skip me, blah, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, uh, And he just kind of looked around. And they could see him in the courtyard the whole time. They could see Jesus. John, the other disciple, and Peter, they went there because John was the friends with the high priest, and his family was friends with the high priest family. He got into that courtyard. They were there. They were watching him, beating him. They were watching him doing all these things, and, and, and they never stepped up. This is that same Peter. I will go to prison with you. I will, I will die with you. Well, here's your chance. Here's your chance. Well, uh, um, hmm. I mean, I really didn't think he'd take me up on the offer. That's why I was offering. I mean, if, I, if I knew, I mean, I might have said something, you know, that I'll pray for you. You're going to pray for me. You're going to pray for me, right? I mean, Satan's going to sift me as wheat, and all you're going to do is pray for me? I mean, there's all these things and all these excuses and all these things just start pouring out. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. I mean, just to see, not only did he betray the dude, but he just turns around and he looks at you. And you just, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're flat cold busted right there. Just as the Lord said. Thankfully, Peter remembers the other words. We get this right here. But thankfully, Peter remembers the other words that when you fail, when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen the flock. We know now that God the Father, through the Son, Jesus Christ, was developing Peter to be a leader in the church. Might not look like it on the surface there, but he was bringing them to all these other things. Remember, it's Peter, James, and John. He was always bringing them in. Maybe these guys were the, the remedial class and they had to come and see all these other miraculous things because they just weren't getting it. The other ones did. Or, or maybe they were just preparing, well, we're preparing them for some type of ministry. But here's the thing that's going on is that Peter's continually all these life lessons. And, and, and that's why when you read First and Second Peter, he says, we're testifying to these things, these things that we know about. Christ crucified. Peter knows something about forgiveness. Peter knows something about the ultimate betrayal and denial and how to be restored. And you could look at the Apostle Peter and go, man, there's hope for me then. There's hope for me then. Verse 63, Now the men who had held Jesus mocked Him and beat Him. And having blindfolded Him, they struck Him on the face and asked Him, saying, Prophesy, who's the one who struck you? Can you imagine these guys on the day of judgment when they stand before the Lord? And they're like, okay, well, he had the blindfold on. He couldn't see, he couldn't see, he couldn't see. You've already spent a lot of time in hell, in the unsaved side, in, in the pit, waiting and tormenting. And now you're going to go before the lake of fire. But you've got one more thing, that you've got to bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then you get the flame and swirly. 
And then as you're standing there, maybe, I don't know, I'm thankful I'm not Jesus, but maybe he walks up to him and goes, oh, you hit me. And you hit me. And you hit me. You understand that's indictment to each and every one of us? Each and every one of us has hit Jesus. It's not just these guys who are there physically doing it, but the things that we've done in our lives, that we've done in the name of Christ, to Christ, as unbelievers, and maybe even worse, as we've, we've come to the Lord and, and have denied Him. But understand this, prophesy now who struck you. And many other things they blasphemed and spoke against Him. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led Him into their council. If you are the Christ, tell us. But He said to them, If, you, uh, uh, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. I mean, I've, every, every Scripture, He's already been with them. All the Scriptures testify about me. Everything that I've said about every You say you have life in the Scriptures. Those Scriptures speak of me. I've, I've fulfilled everything here, and you still choose not to believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. That's a key verse there, folks. That's a key prophecy, because only the Messiah will be able to do that. Only the Messiah will be able to sit at the right hand of God. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Jesus Christ never said He was God. Yes, He did. He said it as a good Jewish boy. He said it to many Jewish uh, uh, learned scholars. He said it just like this. He says, I will sit at... So that's why they ask Him this question. Verse 70. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? They knew who the Messiah is. They knew these verses. They're waiting for the Psalm chapter 2 Messiah. They're waiting for Isaiah, uh, Messiah who comes and rules with an iron scepter. They're waiting for all that. They're waiting for the kingdom of God to be established here on earth. They know all that. He says, I'll be sitting at the right hand of God. Then are you saying that you're the Son of God? <laughs> you rightly say that I am. Yep. I'll just paraphrase for it. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yea, verily. Sure. Right on. Yeah, man. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from His own mouth. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. Because in 4 BC, I think it was 4 BC, 4 BC, uh, the Caesar took away the ability or the authority of the Jews to mete out capital punishment. They pretty much left them alone for a lot of years, but they would, they would stone people and put people to death, and they would mete out capital punishment. And he took that away from them. And the rabbis, if you read the Mishnah or the Talmud, the writings of the rabbis and the traditions of the rabbis and their interpretation, they believed right then and there the kingdom of God was lost. Because Psalm 2 says that he, the, he will rule with an iron scepter. There will always be someone on David's throne from David's family. And they believed that God failed and it couldn't be because they believed the last bit of authority they had was to mete out capital punishment. That was taken away from them. They no longer had an iron scepter. But that's the year that Christ Jesus was born. Someone on the line of David was always there. And we know, I don't want to ruin it for you, spoiler alert, but Jesus dies at the end and raises from the dead and proves he's God. Read ahead. It's great. It's great. We win in the end, folks. We win in the end. But on the outward appearance, it looks like God has failed. On the outward appearance, it looks like Peter's a failure. On the outward appearance, it looks like Satan really blew it having Jesus put to death. And now they've got to bring Jesus to Pilate because the Romans have the authority to mete out capital punishment. And now they have to come up with all these other lies. And we'll get into it in the weeks to come. And understand where Pilate blew it and all these things were going on. And, but understand for each and, each and every one of us, we've all struck Jesus. Each and every one of us, I believe, I have, I think it's happened in every Christian's life, but it shouldn't continue to happen. We've maybe followed from a distance. We've been more fearful of man than we have of God the Father. And yet we have a time that, Lord, understand this, your relationship with God, one, needs to make you sure that you'll go to heaven when you die. Two, you need to stay in that place of God's love. Let me, let me tell you this, Christian. If you do not feel the separation from God because of your sin, when you blow it, then question if you're truly His in the first place. If you're really in pocket with the Lord. It wasn't the sins. Jesus was taking one from the team, folks. He was, he was going to take our sins. 
But the thing that he was dreading was separation from God. That intimate, close communion with God. And when you don't have that, that's when it begins to wreak havoc in your life. Because God has created us and made us to be communal. And He wants to commune with us. He earnestly desires to have that meal with Him. He earnestly desires to have that relationship with you and I that keeps us in pocket. It, earnestly, the Apostle Paul tells us that daily conforming to the image of Christ. Daily, spontaneously, God, bam, saves me. And I'm going to heaven. But daily I'm conforming into the image of Christ. And as you grow and as you grow and you grow, but you check your own spiritual walk right now. If there's things that you know, like the Bible says, for him who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, what? Sins. If you know that you know that you know that Christ Jesus lives and He lives inside your heart, but yet you can go on and you have a false theology thinking that you can run and do and chew and go with girls who do and do all that stuff, that you think that you can run and you can do all these things because you have a weird theology that's saying that, well, it doesn't matter what I do in the body, it's the spirit that it goes to heaven, so I just matters. That's Gnosticism. If you have that false theology of Calvinism that says, well, those who are all elect are going to go to heaven and all those who are going to go to heaven go to heaven and hell and heaven. and that's pretty, no matter, I can just do whatever I want because I'm one of God's elect. You're probably <laughs> going to go to hell. But that you have this right relationship with God that you treasure. And when I have that right relationship with God, and I, that's, that's why in my devotions, that's why, in my, that's why I do crazy things of singing <clears throat> out of key, joyful noises to the Lord, praise songs, and I don't know all the words, so I throw them all together. That's why I sing it out loud. There's something crazy going on in my head. There's something going on around me. There's something I just want to do, and I just want to sing out. You're like, no, I'm understanding them a little bit more. I think a lot of crazy things. I'm always singing out. Because I know it is. I, I just took the Scripture says, I don't want to enter in temptation into this trial. So I'm going to do a worshipful prayer just to You, Lord. And it works. And I don't enter into temptation. And I start thinking about the things of God. And that trial, that temptation just goes away. And then when the bigger trials and things come, and, and I begin to think about I, I just there, there's just something wrong here. There's just something not happening with us, and I want to be in right relationship with God. First and foremost, check your own relationship with the Lord. Get those things right, and then your relationship with everyone else will be okay. Not just okay; it'll be great. It'll be superb. It'll be wonderful. But first and foremost, seek the things of the Lord, and realize this: that God has got things prepared, just like the Passover. He's got people and places and things that He might not know of it. No, and it's not just in this little world right here, but there's blessings all around. And God's dealing in each and every one of our lives.